Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for this noon hour talk. I'm Ashley Salvador, and I'm going to be your host for this afternoon and a current city council candidate in Ward Metis. So I'm going to start off with a land acknowledgement. I um, just want to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is Treaty 6 territory and is the traditional meeting ground, gathering place, and traveling route for the Cree, Salto, Metis, Blackfoot, Dene, Nakota Sioux, and other Indigenous peoples, as well as the homeland of Métis nations and a large gathering place for Inuit Canadians and settlers that have and continue to try to make this place better for everyone. Their spiritual and practical relationships to the land create a rich heritage for our learning and our life as a community. These nations are our friends, family, and peers. We honor the nation-to-nation -nation treaty relationship and are committed to continuing our reconciliation. All right, uh, so I'd like to welcome all of our wonderful panelists to today's conversation. And before I introduce each of them, I'm just gonna take a few minutes to speak about Earth Day and really the intention behind today's panel. Now, Earth Day is a day to celebrate environmental protection and preservation. It's a day to marvel at the beauty of our planet and also to recognize the role that we play in safeguarding it. It's an opportunity to renew our commitment to fighting climate change and to draw attention to the urgency with which we must act. Earth Day is about intergenerational justice and equity. And it's about understanding that the actions we take or don't take today shape the lives of our children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Now, I pursued a degree in sustainability because climate change is a real threat. Early on in my degree, um, like most of my peers, you know, I was searching for systemic solutions. I desperately wanted there to be silver bullet, but of course that's, that's just not the case. Um, so I did a lot of thinking about which lever for change I wanted to direct my energy towards and at what scale I saw the most potential to have a meaningful impact. And for me, that's the scale of the city. That's one of the reasons I founded Yeg Garden Suites and got my master's degree in urban planning because land use and densification and the way we move around our cities is intimately tied to climate change. So as I'm sure everyone here is well aware, um, climate change is just a huge conversation and there are many topics that we could dive into today, but we're gonna be focusing on the role <clears throat> that municipalities play in fighting climate change with a specific focus on the city of Edmonton, of course. And with more than 80% of Canadians residing in urban areas, cities have a really big role to play in shaping climate action and reducing our emissions. And really the scale at which cities exist is often where we can see tangible action being taken that moves us towards a low carbon future. All right, so with that, I am really pleased to introduce our four panelists for today. Um, first, we are joined by Shafraz Kabah. Shafraz is the co-chair of Edmonton's Energy Transition and Climate Resiliency Committee of Council and he's the owner of Ask for a Better World. He's previously known for his work at Manask Isaac Architects, where he focused on net zero energy and carbon emission reducing goals for buildings. Over the last 20 years, he's made significant contributions to the design and cultural landscape of Edmonton, mainly through founding MADE, Media Architecture Design Edmonton. He's also been involved with the Canadian Green Building Council, Alberta Leadership Board, and now facilitates the creation of regenerative net zero energy and carbon neutral architecture. So uh, really happy to have you with us to, uh, today, Shabraz. Next up, we have Dr. Nalakshi Joshi. Nalakshi is currently a postdoctoral researcher working on the Future Energy Systems Project at the University of Alberta. Her research focuses on urban transitions to low carbon pathways in Canada. She also teaches a course on planning for low carbon cities at the U of A. She obtained her PhD from the Dresden Leibniz Graduate School in Germany. Previously, she has worked at the World Resource Institute as a consultant for sustainable transport and at the UNESCO chair for earth construction, specializing in low cost and sustainable earth-based construction. Outside of university, uh, she works as a community volunteer at the Strathcona Rail Community Garden. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, our next panelist is Dustin Bajer. So Dustin is an educator, master gardener, urban beekeeper, and tree farmer 
who is passionate about embracing nature in our city. He's a member of the Edmonton Food Council and sits on the Edmonton Area Land Trust Board. For the past year, Dustin has been mapping heritage trees with support from the Edmonton Heritage Council. He's presently creating a tree subscription service, which I am keenly interested in, by the way. Uh, and last but not least, we have Dr. Jim Sandercock. Jim is the Chair of Alternative Energy at Nate and holds a PhD in Microbiology and Cell Biotechnology from the University of Alberta. He works extensively with industry experts to design and deliver curriculum that meets the needs of Alberta's emerging, ener uh, sorry, emerging renewable energy and energy efficiency industries. Nate's Alternative Energy Technology Diploma Program provides students with both the theoretical and practical skills needed to design, integrate, and maintain systems that utilize major alternative energy sources, such as solar, geothermal, wind, biofuels, hydro, uh, fuel cells, and co-generation uh, co as well. So I'm really excited to be joined by this amazing group of leaders. Um, and I sh should also mention that uh, this panel is even more timely, given that Edmonton actually just passed its updated energy transition strategy. Uh, so, and that's a really bold action plan, uh, our boldest to date, that, that charts a course towards a low carbon future. So uh, I'm thinking maybe that's a good place to start for, for our panel discussion. Uh, so looking at Edmonton's energy transition strategy, which again sets out a path for Edmonton to get to that low carbon future, I'd really like to hear from each of our panelists about one concrete action you'd like to see implemented in the short term, so kind of a, a quick win, if you will, in Edmonton's journey towards an emission neutral city. So we, we can talk uh, longer term solutions in a bit, but right now, right off the bat, let's kick this conversation off with some short term, um, immediate quick wins. And let's start with, let's start with Jim. Let's go to you, Jim. So uh, in the energy transition strategy, one of the four main pathways for action centers on a renewable and resilient energy transition. So as someone who knows a lot about greening our electricity and heating systems, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what a quick win could look like. Yeah, so within the city of Edmonton's uh, policies, um, we've got a really good set of pathways, but I don't think that most citizens are actually aware of just how much change has happened. So I think when people think about renewable energy and when they think about energy efficiency or what we could do with our buildings, they're thinking about things like sacrifice and lots and lots of cost. And I think one of the things that the city can continue doing and, and maybe push even more is to help people understand we're really looking at an, an actual industrial revolution right, right now. And that the cost of the renewables that we can deploy and as I'm sure Shafraz will talk about energy efficiency, the costs are coming down really rapidly um, in fact, in Alberta, the cheapest way to make electricity now is with utility scale wind and solar. And, and it's relatively inexpensive even on our own homes with, with solar as well. So just getting some of that data that the city has from its incentive programs and being able to communicate to people, you know, like this is sort of the range of what kind of cost we could be talking about could make a huge difference. Okay, wonderful. Thanks so much, Jim. Um, and absolutely agree. You know that <laughs> it's almost like there's this uh, hidden world that a lot of folks don't know about and, and a lot of that already exists and the technology exists, but, but making that jump to um, sort of realizing it in the real world requires some pretty intensive communication and a lot of effort put into that. Yeah, and one thing I should throw in is like, just to show how crazy it is, like in the last 10 years, for example, solar has dropped by 90% in cost. And like, that's when I say, like I should have said that instead of industrial revolution, I mean, like the costs are just dropping so ridiculously fast and now we're seeing the same thing with solar uh, with batteries we've seen wind drop by about 70 percent in cost over the last decade so it really is just it's hard to really comprehend how quickly things are changing absolutely um and and shifras you know another pathway that's included in the energy transition strategy focuses on emission neutral buildings um so it's sort of related to what jim was talking about but um more on the retrofitting side and being able to build efficient buildings right from the outset so I'm curious what you see as some potential quick wins that the city could capitalize on um, right away in that realm. For sure. Um, right away is to check to see if your building is operating as it was designed and recommission it if it has not. So we waste a lot of energy just in um, poorly functioning mechanical heating, cooling, ventilation systems. Um, even in your own home, like if you haven't 
installed a programmable thermostat, <laughs> that would be your best bet to try and make it a little bit more effective and efficient and even comfortable for yourselves. That relates really to emission neutral buildings in that we have to make sure everything's working as efficiently as possible before we start to retrofit the, the larger big picture systems like the uh, building envelope, the skin of the building, or the wholesale mechanical electrical sort of redevelopment or recapitalization. Because um, a lot of our, our commercial buildings, the big ones in downtown were built in the, the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And we haven't seen any of them actually been uh, retrofitted or, or even uh, have, have major system replaced. So they're functioning on some rather old technology. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, it's an interesting point around just checking whether or not your building is functioning as it should be. Uh, I think a lot of folks will often sort of jump to that retrofit without actually evaluating um, what the existing state of, uh, of the structure is. So really interesting point there. And um, moving to, to Nalakshi, the third pathway that the energy transition strategy identifies is a low carbon city and transportation system. Um, now, I know this is one of your areas of expertise, and I'm curious, you know, how can we plan our city and transportation system to be low carbon? And are there any quick wins in there in that transition? So in that regard, I think the city has done uh, something very smart, is um, already embed um, some of the ideas of the transition strategy into the city plan, because then it gives it more teeth, so to say, um, and also Although it is about a quick win, but it's also about setting a long-term vision. So stop um, investing in infrastructure projects that lock in carbon um, in your city. Um, so I think that that has been a great move. And um, thinking about how this strategy can be changed, can be translated into action, and one way of doing it into these. Uh, documents or into these plans that have a legal status, um, I think is a, a great move and the city should, because it, it's still a strategy uh, and it gets, it becomes real um, if it gets embedded in these long-term visions. So I think that that was a great move and then should be done for um, other similar documents as well. Absolutely. Yeah, great point. You know, it's, it's almost like we have to approach this in phases, getting it actually written down, uh, passed at city council is step one. And then there's a whole implementation side of that that has to follow. Um, and I, I love your point around the connection between the city plan and the energy transition strategy, because they're really intimately linked, um, especially when we're talking about um, our development patterns or transportation systems. Um, you, can't, you can't talk about you know, urban planning without talking about climate action. All right, and, and Dustin, the final pathway that the energy transition strategy identifies is carbon capture and nature-based solutions. Okay, so you have extensive experience implementing nature-based solutions to fight climate change. Um, can you tell us what you see as some quick wins? Yeah, um, so in terms of nature-based solutions, um, I do see this opportunity to absorb um, CO2 from the atmosphere, but I also think that um, there's a really big opportunity to tap into natural solutions to mitigate some of the changes that we're already experiencing due to climate change. And so um, even something like a tree uh, in the right placement uh, to, a, to a building can provide shade during those really hot days and they're active, it's actively pulling water and, and transpiring that to the atmosphere. So it literally is working the same way that, a, that an air conditioner is helping uh, mitigate uh, extreme temperatures. Um, but even things like building healthy soil, porous, uh, a porous sort of sponge city that can hold on to the water that lands there um, in order to prevent flooding um, or prevent drought down the, down the, the road or downstream, um, all while reducing the, um, the energy needed and the hard infrastructure needed to, to normally um, take water away from our landscapes. And so I think that nature is, is kind of a, a nice toolkit for um, saying, okay, these are our challenges. You know, what can we reach into this this this, this nature toolkit and, and pull out that are going to help us um, mitigate some of these challenges? Okay, wonderful. Um, and I, yeah, I'm just such a huge fan of your work, Dustin, because <laughs> I think you really embody that. Um, and and sometimes it can be hard to make that connection and see how uh, a lot of those you know nature based solutions are right in front of us. It's it's a matter of uh, understanding yeah. them and being able to implement them and 
integrate them into our, our urban habitat, if you will. Um, and I should also just mention, uh, folks who are watching this panel, if you have any questions throughout, please feel free to send them in. We will be doing a quick Q&A at the end. Um, so you don't have to wait till the end. If you have any that pop up throughout our conversation, you can send those in and we'll be moderating them throughout. All right, so uh, thank you so much for that kind of quick, quick fire round of, of questions, all of our panelists. Uh, now I wanna get into a little bit of a bigger conversation and uh, we'll let this one be a little bit more uh, free flowing so folks can just uh, chime in whenever you like. Now, sometimes we see climate action framed as being in opposition to economic growth and prosperity. But really, you know, taking climate action is the, in, in my opinion, you know, the central economic opportunity of the next century. So in Edmonton's case, our climate plan is also an economic development plan. It's a plan for prosperity and job creation, and it's also a plan for health. Um, and it's a plan for becoming a more competitive global city that attracts and retains talent. And, you know, I'm a relatively young person. And when I look around at a number of my peers who maybe they go to U of A, graduate, and they're deciding where they want to live, um, a city that takes climate change seriously is on their list. So it's not just about, you know, doing this for environmental reasons. Uh, our future as a city really depends on it. So, and then I guess furthermore, uh, just, just the other day looking at the federal budget, there's actually billions of dollars on the table for green energy and zero emissions technology and, and a green recovery. So my question for our panelists is how can Edmonton position itself to take advantage of some of those dollars and ensure that we're on the winning side of that green recovery? Um, so in other words, you know, how can we ensure that we're skating to where the puck is going? Um, and, and at the end of the day, become that attractive, competitive city that we really need to become. And anyone can feel free to jump. And I know this is a bit of a big question and uh, we can take it whatever direction you'd like to go. Sure, I'll jump in. Um, my work previously on the Board of Energy Efficiency Alberta really showed Alberta is an energy province and we have so much expertise and resources um, in energy, whether it, you know, it's the old style fossil fuels, but what we really do have is uh, sustainable, renewable energy expertise as well. And we need to start to redefine that and redefining that helps us diversify our economy and shows that, like you mentioned, there are uh, hundreds of hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars to unlock in, in the green recovery. Um, one of the things that I like to remind city council is every decision it has to make is a carbon decision. Uh, since the federal government um, stated they're going to bump the carbon tax up to $170 a ton by 2030, that is a game changer financially. So we can now use that as a way to show how reducing carbon, being more efficient, being more green essentially will help us financially rather than hurt us. And I think that's an, a super important part that unfortunately politicians don't like to talk about because it's about taxes. But we have to reframe that as a, a win if we can reduce and use the sustainability uh, expertise we have in Alberta. Absolutely. And um, I want to go directly to Jim on this one, because, you know, we do have a lot of sustainability expertise here in Alberta, and uh, we are an energy province. Can you speak to that, I guess, uh, transition in our, our energy sector and really the, the job side of things as well? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I, what I should start by saying, is, and this goes to the stuff Shafraz is talking about, is, I mean, for the homeowner, often the least expensive way to reduce the amount of greenhouse gas we give off is to look at that efficiency piece. So I don't want to leave that off the table, but I'll, I'll talk also, we, we think about that a lot, but also about the generation side. Um, there's a lot of growth in that, in that field. So if we look at, say, for example, the institutional investors that are putting money into Alberta, about six years ago, the largest project we had for a solar plant in Alberta was about a megawatt. A couple of years later, it was 17. A couple of years later, it was about 50. Um, Trans Canada Pipeline just fired up a, a 100, and I think it was 136 megawatt project uh, this week. And then uh, in about two years, we'll have a 500 megawatt, uh, 
well, 400 megawatt project here in Alberta. These are the biggest projects happening in all of Canada. So obviously there's a lot of employment in, in that realm. Um, but I think something in terms of what Edmonton can do is continue to take uh, as council can take it seriously that this is a diversification play. This is the new industry. So within Edmonton itself, within our own boundaries of trying to build that industry up, as opposed to another city or another town building that industry up, because of course you can roll the truck and go do projects, you know, in, in, other, in other cities and towns as well, is to really, we, the institutional money is being unlocked now, but to unlock the money that our citizens have and that our local businesses have by continuing to have uh, incentives for the city to continue to offer incentives for renewable energy projects, especially solar in the city, and continue to work on PACE, which is a property assessed clean energy process, that people can use their own properties to find financing. I think those are the things that the city of council has been working on. We're seeing that in a lot of the documentation and we should, we should double down on double down on that and just keep going. Wonderful. And um, just before I go to the other panelists, I want to jump back to Shafraz for a second. Uh, do you see those types of opportunities embedded in the energy transition strategy and, and sort of direct uh, recommendations to introduce those types of incentive programs for Edmontonians? Absolutely. Actually, mm -hmm. it's been great to see in the community energy transition strategy uh, pace kind of come up as a, a a plan of action for the very short term. So hopefully by the end of the year, we'll finally see some dollars actually um, be put towards what the city calls the clean energy incentive program or SEEP, which is the same thing as pace so that hopefully will be the um, the lever the city can unlock homeowners in doing a lot of uh, more expensive types of work Wonderful. it sounds like a relatively quick win to me <laughs> in the in the short term all right and um nilakshi or or dustin anything to add to this conversation around how to how to position ourselves as a city to take advantage of um a lot of the transformative change that's happening in this industry um, so I think a, a great opportunity uh, lies ahead of Edmonton because um, cities that have been forerunners in um, being sustainable or being green, and there's this term uh, which is called green branding. Um, many cities have used that. And one city that comes to my mind is Freiburg in Germany calls itself a green city. As a tourist industry um, around that idea, people come to the city to see what the city has done. Um, and um, by positioning uh, itself as such a city, um, the city has unlocked uh, not only a great deal of interest in it, but is also then the forerunner for um, financial um, aids that come to support such ideas. And I think Edmonton has a huge opportunity in that regard. Um, when so many factors are against Edmonton's a, so if you can fix it here, if you can uh, figure out ways of doing it here, you can do it anywhere in the world. Um, so having that and um, doing that turnaround, uh, re-imaging itself um, and becoming a leader um, in this is a great opportunity uh, for the city and its plan. Wonderful. So really leaning into that, um, what was that identity as, uh, as a green city, as a green leader is gonna be important for, um, for our future. Okay, and Dustin, anything to add to this? Well, I guess a, a couple of quick thoughts. Um, I think this was already touched on in terms of, um, you know, being able to encourage homeowners to, uh, you know, retrofit their buildings. Um, I guess like I'll, I'll maybe reiterate it, but uh, the, I think there's there's really that need to to pay attention to that just climate transition, so that the folks who, um, you know, maybe can't afford the the, the solar panels or the you know to reskin their home um, have that that ability, and so that it's not just kind of a handful of Edmontonians, but um, uh, you know this this community effort. Uh, the other thing that that keeps coming to mind as I, I listen to the other panelists talk is how. Um, how much better this city, this future sort of city sounds. Uh, and I, I love Edmonton and, and I love my neighborhood and I love my community. Um, but, uh, you know, this, this city that is, um, you know, a climate resilient city that is a climate smart city uh, actually seems like a much more interesting and better place to live. 
Uh, and so that's a lot of what personally um, kind of motivates me for, for wanting to see these, these shifts. Absolutely. And, you know, envisioning that, that climate resilient future, um, it's being able to walk to your corner store, being able to walk to a grocery store, having more dense communities so you don't have to be reliant on a personal automobile, you know, having safe walking and biking infrastructure so that you can get to where you need to go in a low carbon manner, right? Um, so I think that when we start to conceive of what that future could look like, um, it could really be a, a better, more vibrant city that, that is promoting health and wellness and inclusivity and, and connection in community. So like I said, you know, yes, this is a climate plan, but it's also a plan for, for prosperity, um, for health and wellness. One of the things Dustin brought up, and I also see in the question section, uh, Rocky also brought up, was about wanting to make sure that we're not just giving opportunities to people who already own a house. Um, and so Rocky brought up a really good point that I had it on my list of things to say, and I, I thought I was going on for too long. But there's community generation opportunities um, if people want to uh, participate in building solar in Alberta, but they don't actually have a house. Maybe they're a renter or their house isn't appropriate. You know, it doesn't get a lot of sunlight on the roof. So there are opportunities for people to take part in uh, larger projects as an individual in community generation projects. And so that's something to keep an eye out for everybody that those are gonna be places people can participate. And then the city also understands that there's a split incentive that you know the owner of an apartment building, for example, might not be wanting to spend a lot of money on insulating if they don't pay the energy bills. And so you've got a person renting an apartment who has walls that are just bleeding the heat right out of the building and they have to pay the utilities. And so there's a building labeling program that the city of Edmonton has been doing for a while now. Um, and it's, it's just gonna be good for the city to continue with those sorts of incentives to try to put labels on buildings, help people understand, hey, if I What's my carbon footprint likely to be like? And people are going to start making choices about where they choose to live or where they choose to lease for their building, uh, their, for their business based on the labels on the building. So I think that's really positive that the city's been doing as well. Wonderful. And um, I do see some more questions coming in here uh, in our chat box. And maybe um, we'll just take a quick detour to the chat box, answer a few questions, and then loop back to um, some of our pre-prepared questions. So uh, let's see here. Um, so someone's wondering, uh, about the River Valley. So would love to hear some, some comments around the River Valley as a lifeline in terms of climate change and biodiversity loss. Um, and maybe let's go to, to Dustin for this one and then um, anyone else can feel free to jump in. Yeah, I mean, Edmonton is really fortunate to have this, you know, sort of ribbon of green that, that heads diagonally right through the city. Um, and so, I mean, for, for lots of reasons, I mean, obviously it's a great place to go for a walk and, and hang out. And there's, there's that aspect to it, but, um, you know, also it, it does provide a little bit of a, a buffer in terms of, um, runoff from the city. Uh, sometimes that's just kind of, uh, by accident. Sometimes that's consciously built into, uh, the development of some of these park spaces like, um, oh, I always forget the name of it. Um, Hermitage Park has, uh, is actually, um, there's a big, uh, pond that's been built there to actually take, the, uh, a lot of the runoff from the city above, uh, run it through some biology, have the biology clean that sediment out, and then before, and then it heads into the North Saskatchewan instead of polluting it. But um, uh, so I think it's critical that we protect that that existing green infrastructure. Uh, and then I think it's it's also in some ways um, can be like a little bit of a, a model. Um, I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find ed any Edmontonians who don't enjoy the River Valley. And so I think. Um, you know, if we can, if we can say, you know, let's, let's draw that up into our city a little bit, let's recreate, you know, aspects of this, um, you know, in our communities, I, th I think it's kind of easy to, to, to envision and, you know, that can become, um, I mean, part of, part flood and, and drought mitigation, um, could even become part of, uh, waste reduction. I'm not advocating throwing your garbage in the river valley, but in terms of, um, uh, compost, organic matter, uh, so there's, yeah, there's all kinds of benefits there. And I'm not even touching on, you know, just the benefits of having biodiversity and protecting native species and, you know, the biophilic benefits that you get from when you, when you walk through and, and see green spaces and, you know, sort of the, the uh, mental health uh, uh, benefits to that. I'm meandering, so I'm going to let somebody else jump in. <laughs> Anybody else have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would like to uh, chime in. Um, 
So what Rocky is asking about the river valley, um, I think uh, the recent discussion around the um, solar farm based in the river valley is a very good example because the city does have um, a climate emergency, but does it also say that um, we are also in an ecological emergency? So when you have something like the river valley, um, it it's time to protect it, uh, sort of rethink uh, your relationship with energy and reimagine energy. And I think the second part of um, Rocky's question answers that. Um, so are we still, are we moving from big oil to big solar or are we sort of reimagining that? Are we thinking of more um, community owned energy, distributed um, ownership of energy, uh, microgrids, uh, so sort of even fundamentally reimagining as urban dwellers where this energy comes from rather than sort of um, saying or sort of outsourcing it uh, to the periphery of the city and now even within the city. Um, so yeah, so to think of it um, both as a climate and an ecological emergency at the same time um, would definitely help uh, to preserve the river valley, not just the river valley, but even other green infrastructure in the city. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I really like your point around, yes, absolutely climate emergency, but also ecological. And Edmonton's in a really, you know, in many ways, uh, privileged position to have just this gem uh, in the center of our city. And, you know, I, Dustin, I appreciate your, your comments around sort of the physical and mental health aspects of that. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the ecological function that that provides to, um, to Edmonton and the surrounding area, it just, it, it can't, be, uh, can't be overlooked. So thank you so much for that question, Rocky. Um, I know there's some other ones coming in, Trisha, I'll get to yours in a second, but um, we're gonna loop back to the uh, regular programming and then we'll jump back to some more questions. Okay, folks? All right, so, so the next question I have for our panelists here, um, we're you know, often talking about concrete actions, um, pointing to, to real life concrete approaches to reducing emissions. But one thing that I've noticed over the past few years is there's actually been, in my perspective, a fairly significant shift in the discourse and attitudes towards climate change. And, you know, much of the general population is starting to, to really get on board. So I'm wondering what kinds of changes you've observed in the way people are approaching and just and just talking about climate change in general. Because, of course, you know, the, the discourse and the framing uh, is quite intimately connected with the actions that we're willing to take. And, if we're talking in political terms, the courage that those politicians have to actually make the decisions necessary um, to, to impact real change. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm really fortunate in that I end up uh, working with um, a lot of high school students. And one thing that's, that's kind of come, um, become evident to me is that uh, like these kids have grown up with climate change uh, like they, they've never experienced a time where that hasn't been like this sort of big looming thing. And um, I think there's a little bit of a danger of maybe like being burnt out or maybe feeling like, how do I, how do I engage in this really is sort of seeming this existential problem. Um, but I also think that you get a lot of students who are, you know, a lot of young people who are kind of like, let's, let's get on with it already. You know, we've been, we've been debating this for, um, for decades. And so uh, to see, to have conversations with, with young kids about, um, you know, the careers that they want to pursue and the lifestyles they, they want to live, I'm, I'm really encouraged because I think you, we do have this, um, this, this generation of people who are, you know, they just kind of want to get on with it and, and enact some of those solutions. Uh, and they, they're not, yeah, maybe, you know, they've, in, this is sound bleak, but in some ways, you know, they've grown up with this, um, you know, this, this sort of dark future, right? Like it's this, this climate change world. And so I think a lot of them are very motivated to, um, to steer clear of that vision and to create something um, much more uh, uh, pleasant and, and, and happy. And so, and so, uh, so I, 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 I do think that um, you know, there is this really big shift that, that is happening. And um, yeah. Wonderful. And, you know, Jim, you also work with students, don't you? Uh, yeah, yeah, we do. So do you find that there's sort of uh, similarities there in, in your experiences to Justin, or sorry, to Dustin's? 
Yeah, right now what I'm seeing mostly are people coming to the program who are saying, you know, I want to get out of a different career and, and change careers. So we've got a lot of people doing, uh, redoing their career that could be, you know, I think our average age is about 28. And so some people are coming to it strictly from, a, I'd like to get on board with this new technology and this new industry, but the vast majority are coming in and saying, you know, there's, there's something that we need to be doing for, uh, for our climate and for our ecosystems that we're just doing a disservice to them by using the atmosphere as a, a giant dumping ground. So I would say that there's a big change in terms of our student body has been growing. There was a question, somebody saying, is there a lot of people wanting to pursue the career? And, and the answer is yes. Um, and, and um, what people are really seeing is that, you know, the, the opportunity that is there is usually not what people are mostly thinking about. Mostly they're thinking about the ecological impacts of how we make our energy and use our energy now. And then they come to understand actually from a technical feasibility and from a financial feasibility, these things make a lot of sense too. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'm just reading another comment here in, uh, in the chat from Jordan. Um, really reflecting on both, uh, both the comments from Dustin and Jim here that, you know, feelings around the future have changed a little with recent good news, but I've always thought for over 10 years that I don't even want children because of the state of our climate. Um, it's hard not to be pessimistic sometimes when you think globally, um, but what keeps you hopeful and motivated, or his question is what keeps you hopeful and motivated to continue doing the work that you do? Um, and that's a great question. You know, we're faced with literally, you know, this existential crisis, huge, huge problem. Um, it can almost be paralyzing at points. Um, and I mean, I, I went through that uh, my four years at Dalhousie doing a degree in sustainability. You know, within the first week, you're just introduced to just layer upon layer of, uh, of structural problems and challenges that got us to the point we are today. Um, and it's pretty hard to peel back those layers without feeling overwhelmed. Um, so can anyone speak to that? Like what keeps you motivated and hopeful uh, to be able to keep pushing forward? Well, sometimes it's just a matter of you just get up in the morning and go, what can I, what can I actually, actually do? And so if we have thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who are making it their career to say, I'm going to do things that are going to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases being emitted, that's what I'm going to do today. And tomorrow I'm going to do it. And the next day I'm going to do it. Um, then I think we've, you know, as we build a movement, as we build up that industry, it's already, you know, significant, but as we build it even more, we just have more and more people um, doing that work. I think as we gain mass, we're, we're going to make a big difference. I, I mean, the reality is, is that there will be negative impacts. Um, and you just got to kind of put that on the side of the desk and go, yep, that's going to happen. And there's lots of reasons we've got some momentum there uh, causing ecological damage. Um, but we'll do everything we can. I think one of the things that's really encouraging to me is the degree to which these, the costs associated with the stuff we're talking about keep dropping. So they're going to become business as usual to continue using an internal combustion engine vehicle in 20 years just won't make financial sense. And so I think there's a lot of things driving, even the economics are driving us in the right direction now, which only happened within the last three to maybe three years. Absolutely. And you know, that, that price piece is just huge, Jim. And at the end of the day, I mean, we need to get to a point where sustainability is the default. Um, we need to be creating our cities in a way that uh, enables Edmontonians to just live a sustainable lifestyle, because that's the way we've designed and built our city and our systems and our society. Um, so, and, and the Lakshmi and Chapraz, I'm curious uh, on your end as well, you know, how do you stay helpful? How do you stay motivated in, in this space? So yeah, I agree that any any discussion on climate change uh, starts with a whole bunch of bad news. Uh, but then um, just taking into account what has happened in the last 10 years uh, in terms of this becoming mainstream conversation, um, this also becoming a mainstream political agenda um, has been very encouraging. Um, I know in Canada, green parties are still on the fringe, but then globally they are moving to the center. They are uh, bringing that um, agenda um, as a central agenda. Um, and then uh, this connects back to the earlier discussion on youth being engaged in this topic and wanting to do something, uh, because this is something that is a default for them, um, growing with the idea of climate change. I think that is uh, very, very encouraging. Um, um, and I think, yeah, I think if we're moving, although our problems are increasing, but then the efforts to counter those problems have also increased in the last um, years. 
Absolutely. And Shafraz, anything to add to that? Um, I'm, I'm powered by deep climate anxiety. <laughs> um, so I think that's a commonality here. <laughs> that said, I, I think uh, Dustin nailed it in the chat. If you can imagine a better world, you can create it. Um, and it's just through conversations like this and finding people who are values aligned. And I, I've, I think that's why I started Ask for a Better World is, is uh, working in that sphere of values alignment and only working on the projects that deliver that and ensuring that um, we, we are making strides in that. And it's through also the leadership of uh, the city of Edmonton, like declaring uh, a climate emergency uh, and standing for the Edmonton Declaration to live up to the Paris Agreement. Those are very, very bold things to do. And we have to um, help make that happen as, as a city and as citizens to, to ensure that works for all. Absolutely. And, you know, just building on, uh, on that, Shafraz, I think Edmonton, it's, it's almost like an unlikely leader in a lot of these spaces and not just the energy transition strategy, but um, the city plan as well. I mean, there's some ambitious, bold visions that are laid out in these plans. And, and the fact that um, we're able to get, you know, enough people to say yes to them to, to ingrain it into our, our future plans and strategies. I mean, that says something as well. And, and that for me keeps, keeps me hopeful. Um, of course, there's the whole implementation side, and those are going to be tricky conversations, and there's going to have to be uh, courage on that end. But the fact that we've gotten to this point, um, it says a lot. All right. And looking at the time, I think we have time for, I'm just going to go through one last question, and then I'm going to loop back to Trisha's, because I think that's a good one um, around the, just loop back here. Yeah, around the federal budget and some of the incentives. Uh, for Canadians. So keep that in the back of your mind, panelists. We're going to chat about that in a sec. Uh, but at the, uh, at the end of our panel here, I'd love to have each of you share, I guess, one thing that you think um, you wish people knew that, that is related to Edmonton's role in taking climate action. So um, Jim, I know you, you kept uh, communicating that Cost is coming down. You're shouting it from the rooftops. Everybody, look how low the cost is. Take advantage yep. of this. Um, so in, in each of your uh, individual specialties and areas of expertise, what is one thing you wish that Edmontonians knew in uh, in Edmonton's fight against climate change? So you, you did turn that for me. So I think that the costs are coming down. There are $2 billion of solar projects going on in Alberta right now. There's the largest solar plant in all of Canada, just got commissioned in Alberta. We're gonna be seeing one, it's a half billion dollar project being built again in Alberta. So not all of that is happening within the boundaries of Alberta, of course, uh, Edmonton, of course, but I think that just the, the idea that people realize this is a whole new industry. And as we're looking to diversify the economy, um, Edmonton has been re really a very strong leader and we are, we've got a lot of companies that are doing renewable energy here in Edmonton and to continue understanding that this is a, a great diversification play. Absolutely, absolutely. So really making that strong link, um, not just a climate action plan, diversification plan, jobs, and jobs. Plan, health yep. plan, um, it's all connected. Okay, yep. anybody else? Sure, um, I, I wish people knew Alberta was at the, uh, Last year, Alberta had the three most expensive climate-related disasters in all of the country. So we often don't recognize how much we are very vulnerable. We're, we're one hailstorm away from hundreds of millions of dollars of damage, or one tornado away, or one massive flood or fire. But Alberta actually had the worst of it in 2020. And I think what we have to do, and this is why I'm powered by deep climate anxiety, is, is recognize we, there's no more sitting on the sidelines or expecting you know, things to, to happen. We actually need to demand it to happen faster. And we have one generation to turn our, 
our oil and gas space province into a completely emission free province like by 2050 we are off of fossil fuels and we we need to mobilize as quickly and as you know expediently as possible so absolutely and you know your point around it it is happening here um i think it can often be like this far off distant thing that's happening elsewhere um and correct me if i'm wrong but i believe edmonton is one of the fastest warming regions in the world correct yeah yeah so i mean it is yep. here sorry go ahead just the further north you go the bigger the the degrees of temperature change have happened and we are the most northern city absolutely and um Nalakshi or dustin anything to add that you wish you know edmontonians knew uh, related to climate action here in edmonton yeah, I would uh, encourage everyone to look at the Edmonton City Plan um, because it is one of the first to um, bring climate accounting in it. And I think it took a lot of effort to get that plan, get that vision, uh, because it will decide how the city looks like in the next um, decade or so. Um, so look at it. It's very ambitious um, and pioneering in uh, many aspects of uh, carbon accounting, acknowledging the ticking carbon clock. Um, yeah, and see see that uh, if uh, your actions can contribute towards building that city. Absolutely. I think we need a whole panel on the city plan. I'm very passionate about the city plan. <laughs> I could go on for days, uh, but I won't right now. Dustin. Uh, yeah, maybe the only thing I'll add is um, that we tend to view cities and nature as in, some, as in opposition. Um, but in reality, cities are already some of the most biologically diverse spaces on the planet. Uh, I think that if we consciously invite nature into our cities in, um, you know, strategic ways, there really is a tremendous opportunity to not only create, um, you know, sort of a, a better, better places to live, but to actually mitigate some of the challenges uh, that cities um, due to the concentration of people and resources uh, create, but also due to, um, but also to mitigate some of the effects of, of climate change. And so I, I really feel strongly that there are lots of opportunities there. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, a few years ago, I started to shift my thinking and I always refer to cities now as our human habitat, because if we, if we start to bring that type of ecological language in, um, we start to bridge that gap uh, that, that you just described. Now I'm gonna loop back. Thank you so much for all of those answers, by the way. Um, those were incredibly insightful and uh, folks are enjoying them. So this is great. And going back to Trisha's question that I told you to kind of plant in your brain there, uh, she's keen to hear what our panelists think about the federal budget and some of the incentives for Canadians to make the transition to green energy in their own homes. So to not just babble off a whole bunch of numbers that won't stick, I typed some of it into chat. Okay. And so the federal budget, because I want to do stuff to my house too. So I think we're all on the same page on that if we've got you know, the opportunity. So there's $3 billion currently available for net zero goals to be retrofitting our homes. But the new budget also has a $4.4 billion interest-free loan program that they're going to be putting together for over five years. So it'll be split up. So if you can't get to it this year, I mean, it's going to be around for five years. Uh, and there's $17 billion also available for skills, training, and trades. Um, and uh, there's also $5 billion, not, not for your average, average cat, but there's about $5 billion also for industry projects to reduce greenhouse gas uh, emissions as well. And then within the city of Edmonton, and I just got partway through typing it, um, there's a program called HERA that can be used to retrofit your homes. And so I'll just type that in. Uh, and then there's also, uh, I always call it PACE, but it's actually uh, CEIP, Clean Energy Improvement Plan Program. So I'll put that in as well. That also has uh, financial support for people who want to do retrofits on their house, including solar or retrofits. Uh, and that's attached to your, to your property tax to, to you know, have a certain amount of capitalization on the loan. Uh, and then there's also an incentive in Edmonton also, uh, I think it's 40 cents per watt to install solar on your on your house or building, depending on the size of that project. So I'll, I'll type a few more things in, but there's definitely a lot of things going on as of like, Edmonton's been at it for a while, but the federal budget really did change things. Awesome, and thank you so much for, uh, for including some of those figures in the chat there, Jim. Um, anybody else comments on the federal budget? 
just on the last uh, line that uh, Jim just mentioned about skill training and trades, uh, and I think the city is doing a very great job um, of, so when you are installing that solar panel or when you're getting that um, energy retrofit done, um, it's also an opportunity uh, for local skill development, for employing your local contractor, um, your local architect to get that expertise uh, going up and going in, uh, in the community. Um, so yeah, so you just be, I, I, and I think uh, what, what these uh, grant programs do is push for this. Uh, and I think it's a very uh, smart move uh, to allow for that just transition to happen. Wonderful. Um, and Shafaz, did you have anything? It looked like you were reaching for your mic. Are you good? I'm good. Okay, awesome. Um, and it looks like you did add uh, a link into the chat for you to see. Uh, I, I added the. Yeah, I added the some of the programs. Wonderful. Jim talked about. Lovely. Okay. Perfect. And uh, so, Trisha, feel free to check those out. Hopefully, that was uh, a comprehensive answer. I think it was. And I'm going to go to our chat box. We just have probably time for one, maybe two more questions. Let's see. Okay. So, oh, this is a good one. Probably, probably this one's for for Nalakshi. Um, so it's related to transit and transportation. Um, so this person says there is so much that needs to be done to implement uh, an effective transportation system, specifically ETS. Um, and they're wondering, I guess, how can that be improved? Uh, what, what do we need to do to have a transit system that's actually going to be viable, functional, um, and enable people to uh, get out of their personal automobiles um, if they so choose? Um, so I think transit cannot be seen in isolation. Transit and land use um, and building densities are interlinked in a way uh, that you need one for the other to happen. Um, so designing a transit system and an efficient public transit system uh, when there are such low densities is a huge challenge. Um, so I think what the city um, is trying to do is now den densification of the core um, and I think that's a great great area to experiment because as you would see, if there are more people taking that transit, it automatically makes it viable. Um, and uh, the idea of uh, 15 minute uh, districts is coming up. So eliminating the need uh, to move from A to B. Um, and I think COVID has been uh, a time to realize that. Um, so re really reimagining um, the system. So for example, Public transit in isolation would not work. Um, dense, vibrant neighborhoods where you can probably walk to work um, or um, easily access uh, the transit is, so having a holistic vision is uh, what I would say uh, would take us there rather than uh, pasting an idea which probably in isolation doesn't work. Absolutely. Um, I, I love how you speak about it. It is a system, you need to see it holistically. Um, that's one of the things I'd you know, be excited to bring to the table because uh, the city is just this sort of messy, complex, um, sort of ever evolving system. And if, if you think of just transit or just housing, you're not gonna see the results that we need. Um, and 15 minute districts, I think are, are really at the core of that. Um, over the last year, a lot of us have had our you know, geographic footprint shrunk to the scale of the neighborhood. And we're starting to think, okay, if I'm gonna be living locally, do I actually have all the amenities and things I need within a close walking or biking distance? And in a lot of cases, the answer is no, in a lot of our, our neighborhoods here in Edmonton. So yeah, really prioritizing that, that densification um, and of course, safe and effective transit to, in conjunction with that is what's gonna help put us there. Yeah, I mean, looking at another question, this is a good one. So someone's wondering, uh, you know, uh, energy transition strategy, it's huge. There's just so much to implement. And how do you triage things? You know, how do you, how do you decide what comes first? Um, I know it is divided into sort of quick, quick wins, short term type actions that can be taken. And then there's longer term uh, transformational changes. But with this really long, hefty list of things that we need to do, how do we prioritize? How do we triage? Well, um, the action plan that's attached to the community energy transition strategy has did ha, has done some work on that. So they do have some short-term actions and actions that are really looking at impact of uh, carbon reduction. 
So we, we are working with city administration to really mobilize that. And we tried to reiterate at council that you can't wait till 2023 when you are funding the next cycle of all of these things, you actually need to start tomorrow. So um, that's in play. And we are, we are doing our best at the energy transition and climate resiliency committee to, to provide sort of that direction, including um, the nature-based solutions and including a just and equitable lens. Because that, that I heard uh, many times today, but it, it's been a really important part of our work. Absolutely. So hopefully that answers your question uh, around triaging. Um, I think it does. And yeah, if anyone wants to actually check out the energy transition strategy, it's an amazing document. Um, and as Shafraz just said, there there is sort of um, some, some work being done around that triaging piece, how to figure out, okay, what are the easy things we can do now? We have to start now, um, but thinking longer term, uh, what can be done, you know, in the next four years, next five years, next 10 years, uh, because ultimately we need to lay that groundwork immediately. All right, so looking at the time, I, I like to keep things uh, nice and timely, so I don't wanna go over. So I'm gonna wrap up, and I just wanna really, really thank all of our panelists for joining us today. Um, it means the world to me, and I hope everyone found this a really engaging discussion. Um, thank you for joining us on Earth Day as well, uh, spending a, a bit of your time with us. So just to wrap up, you know, cities are really, really crucial to fighting the climate crisis. And, you know, I'm feeling inspired by this conversation. Um, I know we got into sort of the, the heaviness, the climate anxiety side of things, but, but these conversations for me are, are a light of hope. And yeah, it can feel daunting because it is daunting, but Edmonton's new energy transition, transition strategy does help us chart that course to a low carbon future. And creating the energy transition strategy and actually having it pass this week at council, as I said earlier, that's a huge step. And now is when the rubber hits the road, um, rubber of bike tires, that is. Um, <laughs> and we get to talk about implementation. We get to talk about how we're actually going to realize what's laid out in this plan. And the strength and efficacy of this plan will really bear out in its details. And as Shafra said, you know, some things are, they need to happen immediately. They are happening immediately. But a lot of these conversations are largely gonna be up to the next city council. Um, and I have really hope to have the opportunity to serve uh, and help us realize these actions. So if you enjoyed today's talk um, and would like to support a candidate with, uh, you know, the passion and background and, and skills that are required to understand the complexity and interconnected nature of city building and climate change, you know, please consider um, volunteering, donating, give me a call, would love to chat with you and just want to really wish everyone a happy Earth Day. All right, thanks so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Take care. Thank you. Great work, Ashley. Thanks so much. You were awesome today. I uh, really, really appreciate it. Yes. And Dustin, I think he nailed it. Oh, uh, Dustin, Dustin, you're the best. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, no, this was a thank you for the invitation. And um, it was, yeah, it was. A, honor to sit on a panel with all of these all of these doctors i'm not a doctor <laughs> anyway it's a really nice uh, diversity of folks that were able to join us today on the panel and yeah i know it's great i always appreciate the perspective that you bring Justin. thanks yeah day. thank you it was, uh, it was great bye yep, bye everybody take care bye-bye happy birthday